And hey everyone, uh, so nice to meet you all you guys and uh, my name is Jessalyn and uh, let me tell you uh, a little bit about myself. I come from a family of teachers. I have no artist in the family, so uh, my parents are teachers. They teach high school English and of course they are retired now. <laughs> And uh, um, I have uncles, aunts teach every level of you can, from elementary to high school, middle school, and uh, to university. And they are all teachers. And we have no artists in the family. So I am like the only one who like pursuing this different way. And uh, naturally, <laughs> when I was growing up, they didn't think it's a good idea to, you know, live on art. They, they, they think I'm going to starve if I, I pursue this way. So. Um, I was forbidden to draw uh, since um, middle school, yeah, since I, before I went to high school. And uh, this is my inspiration. Uh, I don't know if any of you know this, uh, it's the Japanese manga Sailor Moon, I think it's quite, uh, quite popular and famous. And uh, when I was in the junior high school, I was uh, so obsessed with this Japanese manga and this is my copy of the original art artwork and uh, uh, yeah that was um, not uh, nothing in the creation field I just copied the original art and I love drawing and love coloring and uh, before I started to go to the um, high school my mom forbid me to do this so that's it, and uh, and uh, th this stopped my art world. Uh, my my world of art completely stopped, and that was like I don't know how many years ago, and uh, not until uh, after I was um, I graduated and I uh, went to business school. I studied business management for my bachelor's degree. And I did translation and uh, um, teaching assistant job. And mainly I worked as a purchasing manager for a husbanding agency for ship owners. That's a very narrow field for seven years. So um, that's completely uh, separated from art for so many years, almost like a decade. So um, when I was close to 30, I thought, no, this is not what I want for my life. I wanted, I still love drawing. So I, uh, I'm back to digging like, uh, what can I do? I'm already this old <laughs> and uh, I found watercolor because at that time, watercolor is quite popular in China. And uh, I started trying that, that time I, uh, I'm still working in the daytime. And I found this watercolor is beautiful. I love the texture. I love the transition between these um, brush strokes and the color, you know, very like subtle change. And uh, I pick up this as a hobby along the side. So uh, I work at daytime and I paint at night. This like went on like a year. And uh, after a year, a year or so, not less than a year, I think. And I started to, because I post like my drawings on the internet and the people start to see me and uh, there are like some gigs coming and the, someone will say that hey uh, I can pay you for you know drawing this so I starting to get one or two gigs and uh, after uh, less than a year I think wow I can really live on that so um, I quit my day job and uh, I started to freelance and uh, that's the freelance uh, I have been freelance since then. Uh, I haven't gone, gone back to day job since that. And uh, because I'm, you know, I'm from a teacher's family, so I'm very good at teaching. So uh, after I have kind of mastered a little bit on watercolor, I started teaching <laughs> online. So I have a lot of students back then uh, and I teach them. I, I learned by myself um, how to paint watercolors and I, um, also teach my students how to draw watercolors so that part become a you know a large part of my income yeah and uh, i also have some uh, little gigs so these are the watercolors back then it uh, i don't think it can be called exactly as illustration it's only like you know drawing flowers and uh, uh, objects and it's like painting photos Jesse, I have to interject. Yeah. So you were yeah. 
you were teaching before I had you at SCAD. Yes. Wow, I, I, feel, was... I feel so horrible <laughs> that I didn't know this. We spent an entire quarter together, which I guess <laughs> not, it's not very long. It's only 20 classes, but I didn't know this yeah. about This is- um, Yeah, it's, my story is quite complicated and long. Yeah, I, I was so different from my classmates, you know? <laughs> they are so- I did, <laughs> I did, I did not, I just, yeah, I just didn't realize it. I mean, I guess you had some like pretty, you had you had, you were you had some camaraderie with them you know and I, and I just mm -hmm. I didn't realize that you were on this other on this other level at the time. <laughs> not that um, level. Yeah, yeah, you were like I mean, it's 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 not the typical situation. I guess maybe for grad students to to already have been teaching or, or have some mm -hmm. experience in the field, but it mm -hmm. didn't seem like folks in that class had a lot of experience in the field. Um, yeah. So yeah, keep going. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. This is really interesting. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah, that's, I think that's a gift from my, you know, you know, teacher's family. Yeah, it's like in my blood. Um, and uh, after that, I also started to explore a little more uh, around the art field and uh, I found the photography. So uh, these are something that I did at that time. I, uh, I went to, this one is from the northern part of China and uh, you know, I, I uh, grew up around Shanghai and we don't see snow that much. And uh, when, when I went travel to the northern part of China, wow, that, that's, that landscaping is fantastic. And I uh, took some photos and uh, I also love to bake. And this is, I, I baked this <laughs> and I took the photos. And from these uh, photos I take, photography, I don't think I can call it professional uh, photography I can I learned the composition because you have to like balance everything in this picture and I think that's a help in the illustration too and uh, this is when I really um, you know uh, recognize uh, illustration this is the book that touched me the arrival by Shantan I think uh, you, you, know, you all know about this. It's fa very famous. I was so yeah. like uh, astonished by this book. Like uh, there's no word in it. And you can, you can see the story. You can, you can actually feel the author's feeling and uh, every page and you go through this story. Wow, this is amazing. I, I was like, wow, this is what I like to do. Not those watercolor things. I, yeah, I draw every day and I got bored, you know. <laughs> You, you draw like a flower, you draw like a, a, a cup and that's it. And this is how much you can explore. You can you can tell stories, you can express your feelings. And I, I think I found my love. So this is the beginning, the real beginning of illustration. Oh, sorry. And uh, this is what I prepared um, before I um, went scared. Um, these two, the first one and the third one are actually from my portfolio, you know, to applying for SCAD. And this is, uh, this is done in watercolor and these two are in digital. And uh, this is actually a story um, of myself, <laughs> maybe, uh, because um, my parents always, you know, they are still questioning me now. If you, uh, are you getting enough gigs to, you know, support your life? It's I think it's only natural, but uh, I kind of create the story uh, from the very dark side of the of my own experience. This is like a girl with a very different shape of heart. It's it's different from the you know uh, very normal shape of heart. She has these angles, and uh, her mother wanted to you know uh, they collect all these uh, like bars and uh, like candies these this this normal shape of heart and want to feed her and she just couldn't let let it let, let them do it and she hide all these hearts and she didn't eat them and uh, she still grow her very strange shape of heart it's like my own own side of dark dark side of my story and this is a, a little gig before uh, I went to scared I got from this uh, Daniel Wellington watch I created for them. It's very simple and because this watch is for women and uh, uh, they want to involve some women um, body profile and some plants. So I put this and this is a um, little comic, yeah, very short story, uh, kind of ironic. I created um, for my portfolio. 
uh, it's called the man in the mask. Uh, in this story, uh, the man didn't have a face, and every morning he gets up and, uh, like he he has a room full of these masks and uh, with different expressions. So he decided, okay, I want to go A, B, C, three places today. So I need to collect this, this, this mask and put them in my bag and carry it on my way. And when I went, when he went to uh, went to the uh, goes to this uh, office, and uh, he will put on this, you know, maybe a fake laugh. <laughs> for his boss and uh, and he put on a real laugh for his meeting his girlfriend and uh, at the end of the story he was uh, like uh, tripped on the nail on the pavement and uh, he lost all his uh, masks through under a car and uh, and at that time he is still wearing this smile on his face so it's kind of ironic so these are uh, the four scad and uh, these are during scan. I think you might remember this one, <laughs> the first one, right? <laughs> it's from your yep. class. Yep. Yeah, that's beautiful. I still remember the strange techniques. So many <laughs> steps. <laughs> I still, I still show that. I mean, I still show that piece. I haven't taught that technique since SCAD, but mm -hmm. I, I remember that piece. It came out great. Yeah, thank you. And this is uh, this is from Rick's class, and uh, these two are from uh, Tom's, and uh, this is my thesis work. It's a children's book of my own story, and uh, it's called Smoggy. Yeah, these are from my scat work, and uh, at that time, uh, I think my color palette is kind of you know, mm, I I I don't know, I like I was kind of afraid to use saturated colors so these are all kind of muted and uh, you know mild colors and uh, after that uh, this is also during scan yeah uh, this is uh, this happened at uh, actually the second and uh, the third quarter of my scan time and uh, I was invited from uh, to do a children's book of a Chinese version of The Little Prince, you know, The Little Prince, a children's book for the Chinese version. Of course, we have so many versions and they are still creating new versions. And uh, I was asked to do this children's book. And uh, there are like 38, maybe 37, 38 spreads of that book. And I have to work on this and I have to work on the school assignment. So that was two very, very busy quarters for me. And these are some quarters, uh, some spreads from that book. And Little Prince with the fox and uh, roses. So after I graduate, uh, I um, work as a freelance illustrator. Because um, when I was uh, during SCAD time, uh, I kind of wanted to focus on editorial because um, there are so many different, you know, directions of uh, illustration, like children's book, and, and etc. And uh, I found my interest the most, uh, most thing I'm interested in is in editorial. So um, when I was in SCAD, I also took like some classes. That's from, um, not from, not, not, that class was, I think, taught by Tom, and that's for undergraduate. And I took that class because I want to explore more and uh, build up more uh, portfolios pieces for my for my uh, career after SCAD so um, I was so lucky to uh, got an agent and the agent contacted me actually during SCAD and uh, because I am not a US citizen and I said well can you wait until I graduate and they said yes so that was like a year before I, I graduated so they waited like a year uh, and until I, I graduated and they like had me and uh, I got an agent and I think that's helpful because uh, I am not in the US and I think it's a good thing to have someone you know representing me uh, in the states and uh, deal with all the paperwork and contracts and uh, communication with the clients of course they got they will take they will take like 25 to 30 percent of the commission fee 
back. And uh, as a freelance illustrator, I, uh, except for um, editorial, I also do commercial and also murals and uh, like graphic design, online teaching, everything related to art. And uh, I haven't, what I haven't done for now is a children's book. Uh, that's like a dream, but uh, you know, for all the markets in the different fields in the illustration world, children's book is like paid the less than the least, I think. I think it's, it's like worldwide uh, truth. It's not only in China or only in the US. Every place the children's book is uh, like paid the least. And uh, I think maybe I focused my energy too much on editorial. Uh, I actually got a chance last year and that uh, publishing house is like trying to contact me, contact me with my agent and uh, maybe creating a non-fiction children's book. And after one trial and they said, no, uh, I, we don't think this is children friendly enough. So I was like putting on a tag on me. Like I'm not children friendly, but I'm still trying to work on that because I I got my uh, own children's book for my uh, MFA thesis project and uh, I it's like a dream for me, but I don't know if I um, I'm suitable for that, so I'm still waiting for a chance. And uh, this is my first gig. It's so exciting, and this came when I uh, when I was already back in China. It's uh, February, I think, last year, 2021, and I got this email from my um, from my agent, and he said, "Hey, uh, I got a job for you. It's from Smithsonian Magazine." And I quickly googled who is Smithsonian. I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, the the article is about how uh, to control deer population in the suburban areas. It's a very interesting po topic, and uh, this is a these are four sketches I created and they chose this one. It's like a needle they will, sh you know, give a deer a shot to control their birds. And uh, these are three color comps and they chose the first one. And this is the final piece. Yeah, it was so excited. And when I, 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 I still remember how nervous I got when I'm doing this first gig. Yeah. And uh, it's really this is exciting. It's that. really <laughs> I'll never, yeah. for, I'll never forget the first one, like the first big one, you know, like Smith, Smithsonian's the, the, the big one, you know, like, yeah, yeah, yes. My, my first one was the New Yorker and it was just, wow. it, wow. it was, I was so, <laughs> it, it does, you work in a way that, that you never worked before, you know? Yes, you, yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> yeah. And these are all the works after the first gig. So these are from last year, and these are from this year, and these are all, all uh, editorial pieces. Just completely took off. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see from the color palette, I'm changing constantly. You remember when I, yeah, during the scat, during my time in scat, I the color was like kind of mute and uh, you know mild. Yeah. I, yeah. Now I'm like, okay, I can use any color. <laughs> I. I I yeah I also I I often use the color when you you know in the photoshop uh color picker when this little triangle <laughs> yeah I, I like push myself to the limits like I want to try this color I never use this so yeah now I don't think I have any limits on me it's it's crazy the client list you've cultivated in just this simple <laughs> time like this is a like for somebody pre 2000s like 90s 80s 80s 90s illustrators this would be like a five to ten year client list you know really oh yeah like to to, to amass this many clients that fast not not necess necessarily the amount of illustrations you did but just picking up this many clients that fast is is really impressive yeah i feel so lucky and uh, i i don't know after this but um, the, this year is like on fire. <laughs> Last year is like oh, okay, um, I got one or two count um, like uh, oh, for a month or two, and mm -hmm. this year is like crazy. I I don't know. Maybe uh, more people have seen my work. Uh, yeah, I hope our, this. Our directors, our director, yeah, <laughs> our directors talk. You know, and um, <laughs> and it was it was very snowbally for me too. It was um, mm -hmm. uh, both in the states and overseas. So mm -hmm. it's a, especially within this, 
this particular avenue. It's very mm -hmm. past the name alone. Um, so yeah, keep going. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Okay. Okay, uh, these are some commercials I did. Uh, not that much. Uh, the first one is for um, a hotel called Moxie. And they opened their first hotel in Shanghai last year. And they like invent, invited uh, nine, I think, nine artists from different fields, like photographers and uh, uh, graphic designers, also bartenders and, uh, and DJ, music DJs. And they create this very big opening event that night. And uh, they want every artist to create something for their like uh, hotel hall, big hall. And this is what I did. And this uh, is uh, because the, this hotel is for very young people and they want this to be energetic and uh, open to different people with different uh, backgrounds. So I create these uh, these people jumping into an ocean, a tank of the ocean bowl. And they also they actually create this, made this into a real installation. So this is a real um, ocean ball tank and you can jump into this tank and they had a lot of fun that night and with this mural in the back so that was fun and these two are uh, for adobe and this one is for adobe asia and they found me and they had that campaign last year uh, naming create for good and uh, my topic is access to education uh, like women they have the uh, need to have this equity equities to learn and to study so these are all the possibilities that women after uh, like she got proper education and what she could become and uh, this one is the most abstract one i've ever done since you know my career started and this is for their new website it's the theme is called synesthesia it's like a an ability a sort uh, a certain amount of people they have when they like see uh, the letters they can see colors and when it because uh, like they can see letter a and they said okay this letter a is red and that will stay constant and when they hear music they said okay this music is round and or triangle yeah it's like they have this connection between their senses. So that's the most like abstract pieces piece I've ever done. I create a twisted like field um, of space with these marble balls bouncing around to create something like a sound. And I put these um, very bold strokes around it to, you know, mimic the feeling, kind of like feelings the, the people with synesthesia can, you know, feel. Yeah, this is actually a piece uh, that I I think I will never forget. And uh, this is some mural I did for the local communities in Shanghai. And uh, this one is done in hot summer and this is in winter. And uh, they want to create, because um, it's for the community people and uh, uh, you cannot be too conceptual because they wouldn't understand. They will say, okay, what, what are you drawing? <laughs> so uh, these um, pieces are like, uh, you have to draw um, like what people can understand. You know, uh, they are um, walking a dog, maybe they are having a great time living uh, in a very good environment and, uh, you know, having fun with their neighbors, doing ordinary, like daily stuff. So. Um, this is a very long mural and this is for different walls in the, in the I think this is for an old people um, community. Uh, this, they have this home for the old people and they serve their dinners and the lunches and things like that. Yeah, so um, there's not too much creation in this, but uh, I had a lot of fun painting on the walls and uh, they have so many volunteers to paint with me because it's so long. I cannot simply do it by myself. So there are like 20 or 30 people on a day and we like paint and I, I had a sketch done and uh, we uh, add the color together. And this is another thing I did. Uh, it's graphic design and illustration. Uh, this is from a Chinese client. They wanted to uh, create this threefold brochures on mental illnesses, and they want like advocate um, 
the awareness of like uh, the seriousness of people are having mental illness, uh, illnesses nowadays. And uh, I, up to now, I've done twelve pieces, and these are also uh, these are all the covers. And the, on the right side, you can see how the brochures are laid out. And I did both the design and uh, the illustration. And throughout all these twelve uh, brochures, I have the same color palette so they will look like constant in the series and this is uh the there are uh, like alzheimer's and uh, yeah and also with uh, parent and child relationships and uh, um anxiety things like that and these are uh, some of my personal works after I graduated. And this, these are all, all from last year because I, I am, am so busy this year. I haven't got any time to do any personal works this year. And uh, these, are, these two are also my um, personal focus on the mental illness. And this is for Alzheimer's and this is autism. And uh, the third piece is something I created when, you know, the world is like changing. I feel like, you know, we are never getting back to the before, you know, the world before pandemic and like some everything is falling to pieces. And I had that very negative emotion at that time. And so I created this piece like uh, it's falling from like a uh, 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 like sky and we have so many uh, reflections on these sides of this and uh, uh, yeah the, the, this person is like falling from this thing and uh, she's like falling apart and uh, these are some demos from my online teaching of illustration yeah, and this is like how uh, I, teach, I teach them how to, you know, draw a sketch. You don't have to like draw exactly as you see from the photo or from what's real. And you can change the shape and color and everything and texture stroke. And this is an editorial piece. And uh, this is a repeat pattern. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's done uh, originally. This is actually in traditional way you know, cut the paper in half and, you know, switch the places and then uh, cut another half. Yeah. So these are online teaching. And uh, I think that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Amazing. I have a ton of questions, but... <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> As always. Um, but I I'd like to let some folks chime in uh, here who've been in the session, um, particularly those of you in my classes who are working on conceptual illustration pieces, uh, this is somebody to talk to. Kat, Casey. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, I, I was trying to find the proper way to like word this question, but mm -hmm. uh, I guess the simplest way is uh, a lot of people get asked about just art block and everything of like how you get over it. Um, how do you get past trying to find like, well, you found your type of style, but when you went to SCAD, how did you get into like finding your style? That's that's a very good question. I, I keep asking myself about that question a lot. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, I, I was also inspired by so many illustrators before me and I, you know, look at their answers about style and I think it's just you don't have to worry about style. Your style will find you. It's from somebody else. I didn't create, create that sentence. <laughs> yeah, uh, and I think that's true. Uh, is that Goni? I, I don't know. I, I actually didn't actually meet Goni. I've heard of him, but I didn't have his classes. That's something that I've heard Goni say before. So <laughs> just for yeah. that, it'll- It's it'll like be... everybody is saying that. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree with that. I also see it as like, you can force it, you know? Um, like there's, there are people I feel like, if you look at like somebody like, um, like Sterling Hunley, if you look at Sterling Hunley's sketches from when he was a kid, mm -hmm. they look kind of interestingly similar to the way he draws now. Mm -hmm. And it's not to say that he hasn't evolved. He's obviously evolved, 
but you can just kind of tell he's kind of, almost kind of always drew the way that he did mm -hmm. uh, and somebody like gary kelly as well um and and but there are some people i think who have really drastic shifts from year to year like mm -hmm. from 2010 to 2011 i changed everything completely so you mm -hmm. so, that, so my point is is that it'll it can find you um or you can, or you can force it yes, <laughs> you can yes. really force it out yeah <laughs> yeah yeah i agree yeah. it's like like uh you can let it find you and you like uh let it happen naturally and the, when you actually want to do something you can really change it yeah and i think yeah. that's something that, that that causes a lot of confusion i guess for lots yeah. of folks who profess to be interested in illustration they just want an answer as to like when this happens when is the day you know is there a, is there a follow-up to that cat or do you want to continue with this dialogue um that was mainly it because it's something i've been uh, I've kind of struggling with with uh taking your digital and your advanced illustration class mm -hmm. yeah and it's and again it's not something where you have to, you have to have it by the time you're done i think i've said this to you before but the style i think is or just like the visual look of the work it comes at different times for people and people uncover it force it or develop it at different times it's not a, there's no deadline as to when you need to have a marketable look i think that that kind of that statement that i just made changes though based on your current situation um i was having a conversation about this with um a friend of mine recently where it was i felt like for me it was have a marketable look or die <laughs> at some point it was a very it was very like very str like i was living in a horrible situation you know i didn't have money like i was hungry you know like um i think that that really helped a lot the fact that i didn't have the privilege of having like some kind of financial support system from someone else you know um so there are those people in the industry that uh i think are they're really it, their life depends on it, you know, whether or not they they can yeah. be successful. Um, I wanted to ask you what your method is for your hustle, like your illustration hustle. You're doing the freelance stuff. You're not working at a firm, you know. And I know you, you supplement your your teaching with with the teaching income. But what's yeah. your practice for contacting clients? Like, how do you contact them? Um, you know, or or is it or do you even do that anymore? Is it just something your agent does? Uh. Actually, um, up to now, I haven't done, you know, um, like um, personal promotion a lot because um, I've heard people doing that. You send tons of emails to different like editors and yeah, and they will never reply. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've done that once or two times, I think, but um, I didn't get the reply and I stopped <laughs> and uh, I just got uh, the gigs from my agent and uh, I constantly post things on the internet and uh, I think that's okay for now but I may if I have more time later I, I think I may want to still try to you know do the email thing I don't know if that will work but people say it will work <laughs> but I don't know I, I can try that and certainly I don't have um, honestly I don't know how I'm gonna you know get touch in get get in touch with other you know um editors in other way i don't know because i'm not in the states and i cannot meet them in personally and uh, what i can do is emailing them <laughs> and uh, i think it's um maybe i i have time if i have time i would do that but if i'm busy i don't think i will do that and, so when, uh, when you were at scad you had your agent contact you while you're at scad mm -hmm. something that i <laughs> my students are really interested in is the mm -hmm. idea of per pursuing representation yeah um, and it usually comes th that discussion usually starts with the how do you find an agent question but it looks as if the agent found you so yeah, do, they found do you me. recall how they found you like uh, where, did they, where did they see your work the, the boss of my agent emailed me and uh, he said a colleague of him mentioned me to him and I didn't ask exactly where, but I'm guessing maybe from some kind of winning list of a contest. 
because that's okay. the only yeah i think that's the only possible way they they would know me did you at that time did you have a website and social media presence uh i think um i have a very rough sketch of the website not the thing like that now and mm -hmm. uh Mm -hmm. I think I already had that website, and I I'm posting to on in, on the Instagram. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well then, yeah, it must have been competition, um, yeah, or, I, I... or or social media. I mean, Instagram mm -hmm. has become a big um, art director hub, like in terms yeah. of searching for illustrators via various hashtags. Yeah. Um, and so, what's your experience been like with your agent? Like, are you like are you happy with your agent? Um, from where I stand now, I, I, it's okay for me because um, they, be, um, especially for those like commercial gigs, you have this very long contract and uh, uh, you can take time to understand each terms of this contract, but that will, you know, take a lot of the time and that that's not something will interest me. I, I, I want to focus more on the illustration part. So I think that's mm -hmm. okay. But every time when you see they took that 25% to 30% money out of your account, it's, you know, okay, it's a lot of money, but well, they do their job and uh, you know, we are on the same boat. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Are you are you in a, in an agreement with them where you can only work through them or are you still allowed to continue to pursue freelance gigs on your own without them? Uh it's like exclusively in the North American market. Okay, so if anybody contacts you even if it's not through them. Mm -hmm. Even if I it's not somebody you have to go through them. Okay, I've been yes. noticing that lately with some folks. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, because it, it, when I started with my agency, it was that that we, I would only do, they would only take the 20% the that off of jobs that they actively procured for me. Wow. And then I still, I still had the freedom to pursue clients on my own just so long as they didn't, um, they didn't know my agency or it didn't go through my agency or find mm -hmm. it. So that was actually really cool um, yeah. and, and helped me quite a bit financially at the start. But since, yeah. since then, my agency has, has pursued um, the same practice that your agency is pursuing. What's the name of your agency? Uh, Rep Art. Rep Art. Okay. Yeah. yeah I, I, that, that's become, I've noticed that I think also with Astound, which is also an agency that I think that Alexandra Badiou is represented by the Astound Illustration Agency. How many folks are on, on the roster at your at your agency? A lot of illustrators or not that many? I think about when when I went through their uh, when I go through their website, I think I, I didn't count, but I think there might be a hundred. Oh, <laughs> I don't so know. They, they have quite a bit. They yeah, they are quite big, and they have these two companies, and uh, I think one uh, one of the boss bought another company, and they have these two going on together. Yeah, mm -hmm. at that time I got their email during SCAD, I I asked Rick for help, and I asked him, okay, is this good? Is this okay? And he said, okay, this I've heard of this this company, and they are they are like uh, done this for a long time, and he said, okay, you can go with it. It's safe. Interesting. Yeah. That tends to be the average, like 50 to 100. Mm -hmm. uh, like Snyder, New York, I think, has a little over 100. Uh, mm -hmm. Hence, Frank has a little less than 100. At, mm -hmm. or at least the last time I checked. So that's quite a big. That's quite a big roster. Yeah. Um, and is it is it just illustration that they represent, or do they represent design and and uh, photography and other things as well? I think it's just illustration, and they have these two companies. One focuses more on editorial, and the other, I think, more on commercial things like. So yeah, so your story is very similar in terms of how you found that agent. It's like a combination of hard work and um, getting your stuff out there comfort, uh, in, into the competition so that people can look at it and see it. Uh, mm -hmm. And then also a little bit of luck as well, right? Because they, yeah. they found you. And um, I think that goes to show how important these competitions are. Um, mm -hmm. We do submit on behalf of y'all um, here at MTSU to all of these uh, noteworthy competitions to try and get your names out there. Um, I always tell people, you know, it's more about, it's more of a business decision than it is winning a trophy um, to get in the pages of, of 3x3 and Creative Quarterly. Like art directors look at these things, like they'd rather probably, most of them would probably rather look through these magazines um, to see who's who in the industry 
um, than answer, you know, emails uh, from people. Um, so, I mean, I guess it depends on the person, but it's definitely a good business decision to consider submitting to these competitions. And I wouldn't be surprised if you did learn that your agency actually found you via a competition. Um, yeah, because I think you've been you've been long listed and short listed for the World Illustration Awards, right? Yeah, well, that was last year, 2021. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah like that's a Thank huge, you. huge <laughs> database for yeah. for people to find new talent. Mm -hmm. um, some, another organization I've been looking at recently, I don't know if you've seen them, Doug, is the One Club for Creativity. Oh yeah, I know that. Right? Yeah, like yeah. I didn't I didn't notice. I didn't notice that they like I knew the one club for a while, but I didn't realize that they had like an illustration sector or like an illustration mm -hmm. on it until I started seeing some of the folks on fans of on social media sharing mm -hmm. their, their cubes, their silver mm -hmm. cubes, bronze cubes, their gold cubes. Um, Ed Kinsella picked up a couple golds from the one club um, yeah. and they apparently have a really big network as well, which is mm -hmm. amazing. But they charge like twice the cost. Yeah, I think yeah. So you so yeah, expensive. Yeah, I think it's like, what is it like? I think forty, and that's not even with the a so hundred like for uh, yeah, one it's, single piece. Yeah, that's why you get a really nice cube, I guess. Yeah. Oh well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, wow, I didn't realize it was a hundred. Yeah, it's so expensive. Is that is that for the? Because I know they have like a young guns category, like where it's like new and emerging talent category, and then a professional category. It's, mm -hmm. I think, maybe professional category, yeah. Wow, that's, yeah. that's mm. too is much. That, is that more or less than the Addies, Doug? Uh, I think it's less. I know for the Addies, for the professional, I think it's like 100, um, maybe 120, maybe even more depending on the category, but it's it's astronomical. It's crazy because it's like, I don't know what the, the ideology is behind that. Like how how are you going to find what is truly the best you know if you're doing that if you're putting a financial yeah burden on folks who are submitting to these things anybody want to chime in have a question at all for um for jesse i have a question jesse um okay. i think a lot of i mean everyone's you know reacts to this way but especially students like you know when they see a piece of artwork whether it be on Instagram or um, on the World Illustration Awards, they see an amazing piece, they like it, and they think, oh, I want to do that. But I think the individuality behind it, like how much time goes into it, I think that's always really unique is understanding the process just a little bit more. So is there like a particular part of the process that you enjoy the most? And is there a particular part of the process that not that you dislike, but maybe it, that's more the struggle or it's like, you know, if you get past this part, it's going to be even better. Is there something about the process um, that you could tell us a little bit about your work or about you yeah. behind it? Yeah, um, I think the interesting part, also the, um, you know, most in uh, labor consuming part is in the, you know, sketch, sketching part, yeah. not the coloring part. When, when I got to the color stage, I can really relax because it's like 80% like down. <laughs> yeah. And when you are doing these sketches, you have to come up with some different ideas from for an article from different angles. It really takes time and energy. And uh, that that one is like uh, very time and uh, brains, uh, brainstorm and uh, you know time consuming and a lot of energy engaged. And that's also the fun part. It's like uh, like two sides of a coin, you know. And you you enjoy that part, but there is a lot of you know struggle and uh, you know in it. Yeah. Yeah. But well, you you can really relax in the coloring. For me, I can really relax in the coloring stage, and I can you know put on a video or a television aside yeah. when I can watch it and I can color it. But when I'm doing the sketch, I really have to focus. I I couldn't even listen to anything. You know, I really have to be very quiet. So that's really down in the middle of the night. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's funny you say that because I, I mean, I do comics and I know a lot of people who do comics and I feel like they're the same mindset. Like when they do breakdowns from a script, it's like they need to be in almost a complete isolation because like mm -hmm. you're, yeah. you're planning so many components of like, 
a composition, how did that composition mm -hmm. based off another composition, how you telling the story visually, but you're right. And I've heard a lot of people say like, as you get to the coloring, every stage gets a little bit easier, but especially that coloring stage, it's just, mm -hmm. it's a lot more fun, but a lot less, sounds bad, but a lot less relies on the success of the piece on that stage. True. Um, it's true. The previous stage was the most important, whatever stage that might be. So yeah. mm -hmm. I literally yeah. just told, I literally said the same exact thing you said, Jesse, to my students the other day, that I can't listen to anything, can't watch anything when I'm coming up with the idea, when I'm sketching it out. But then there gets that, there gets to be that point where I'm just painting, where I can just sort of fall into the zone and meditate mm -hmm. and, and watch TV. Um, yeah. to, to piggyback off of Doug's question on process, you have quite a, we're working on conceptual illustration in the digital and advanced class right now at, at MTSU and, um, or at least the, my classes. And um, one of the biggest issues that folks have is thinking conceptually. Um, I'm gonna share my screen real quick um, and it'll stop sharing you for just a second. But one of the biggest issues that the students have is thinking conceptually and how to come up with the concepts themselves. And I've tried to break things down for them in a few ways where thinking about images that have a double meaning, like this is a conceptual illustration that has a double meaning. The brain is a brain, but it's also a maze, right? So you come up with that idea um, and you also come up with ideas that um, manipulate two and 3D space. So you have, you know, it's kind of like this, the, the surrealism of illustration, um, the, the conceptual components. Um, I think this is one that manipulates two and 3D space. Um, and then you also have some that utilize, or do you, I'm not sure that you have any that utilize negative space, like where the negative space is the concept. But this is also a double meaning. Um, how do you come up with these concepts? Like, beyond just the idea of sketching out mm -hmm. these concepts, what exactly is going on in your mind when you're thinking about conceptual illustration devices and how to solve these problems? Well, I think there are um, like two different ways. One is when you, because I love editorial illustration, I see a lot of others work on editorial and uh, it's like uh, there are some kind of pattern you can grab. And, you know, when you think of certain uh, subject and these are like the common things they will generally use in this like subject, because uh, like in thinking and people will think of brain, like in, um, you know, maybe um, uh, is isolation, people were thinking of people in the bulb in, yeah, things like that. And that's like a, a stereotype you can catch when you are drawing that kind of subject and uh, you can learn from other, others. And the other thing is like you can pick some keywords because when you are given a topic, you can like break this topic into different keywords and you can like brainstorm it into even like little, many, uh, even more keywords and you can link these keywords together. And we, with, you know, maybe one, two and four keywords, you can create one image and with like two, five and six, you can create another image. So mm -hmm. that's like how things work. Yeah. So you, so you think about this stuff or do you think about it and then jot it down and make word walls and things like this? Yeah, I sometimes this goes inside my head and I didn't I don't have to like write it down. And sometimes when I really have to think it straight forward, I will write these keywords down and like, you know, doodle on my paper and, you know, can trying to find some links between these keywords. Yeah, I think that's I mean, that's basically what I'm trying to put forth in these classes is mm -hmm. is, is word association and and thinking about exercising your, your head in terms of like how many idioms do you actually know and how many idioms can you actually relate to um mm -hmm. break a leg and all this stuff right like mm -hmm. these, these fun little like sayings um that i think because i think personally i think concept art is kind of like surrealism but not in so much of a chin scratcher arena i think that surrealism kind of like makes you have to think and you may not really understand it but i think conceptual illustration did I say concept art? No, conceptual illustration should be like surrealism, but in a way that people can understand and relate to pretty quickly. And yeah. I think that you, I think that you hit that nail on the head very well. 
Um, so, I mean, yeah, I guess word association and thinking about linking those words together is a really nice way to sort of like start uh, the, the, the juices flowing in the brain, um, mm -hmm. trying to understand how conceptual illustration can be built from the ground up. Um, does anybody have questions on that or want to add to that, especially since it's something that we're diving into in a couple of my classes? I know some of the students in here are currently trying to uh, push through a conceptual illustration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so I have a question because like I love your art like there's just so many different things like I, I really like like a lot of like your nature stuff and the environments so I'm like wondering because you have like so many different images like what is your inspiration for all of them, you know? Uh, I've been asked for this question a lot. What is my inspiration? And I actually don't have an exact answer. And I think maybe inspiration came from everyday life because um, I I I also I like to watch like social news. I like to you know focus on what's happening around the world, and I I care about the world. I I watch like especially the, those negative news when mm -hmm. bad things happen. So when you um, keep these feeds inside and inside your brain and uh, you, you like, and because you hear something, you will think about something and you will have your own opinion. And when that uh, one thing, uh, you know, stacks on, on top of another and you will like form a certain, your personal opinion. And uh, I think that will bring some inspiration to the to the illustration i don't know if that explains the question oh no <laughs> yeah, yeah you're yeah. good <laughs> thank you and there there really is like a clear clear sense of improvement when it comes from your work from just like a few years ago to now as it exists in its current state um i think this is also a kind of hot topic question is how do you intentionally improve right i think that's uh you know, from however, you know, a few years ago to now, when it comes to the polish, the level of finish that your your stuff has, the rendering that your stuff has, is it on purpose? Is it a sort of unconscious evolution? I think that, as we mentioned earlier, you know, the Smithsonian was the first big one, right? The New Yorker was the first big one for me. And in that moment, I saw improvement because of the stakes, right? It was the most yeah. money I'd ever seen yeah. that I was ever going to see for art at the time mm -hmm. uh, and i didn't know if i would ever get to do it again that was another fear <laughs> of mine it was just like maybe this is the fr the the one time that the new yorker calls and then I, I get it and this is great and i'm thankful for it but there was a huge sense of improvement in that one assignment uh just because of how terrified i was about it so have you noticed the improvement that i'm that i'm talking about regarding your work and if so are you consciously improving or are you taking steps to evolve and improve intentionally? I think it um, happens both intentionally and, uh, you know, naturally. And um, for some, just like you said, uh, when you get this very like big client and you, wow, I, I got to work for them. I really have to put a lot of energy on this piece and I, I will do more research than I usually do and uh, I can certainly improve the quality of this piece and also when it happened naturally because I did a lot of you know from this year as you can see from my profile um, I did a lot of for a local magazine in China it's called Sanlian uh, and they really like to focus on those social issues those especially those negative social issues like uh, people got bullied on over the internet things like that and and they, their turnarounds are so tight it's like um two pieces in one day or three pieces in two days things like that. and i have very tight schedule and i have really have to think a lot and uh, you know it, it i really got burned out uh, in a period of time yeah in early this year and you have really have to work so much on different topics and i think that's really um an exercise a very good experience mm -hmm. 
you have to come up with so many different topics, so many different pieces in the very short time period, and uh, it like forces you to think, forces your brain to work, and I yeah. think it's good. Exercise. Yeah, I, I agree. It's and I and I think that for some folks, some students, they've yet to really experience that feeling of like getting pushed off the diving board into the deep end.、Mm -hmm. um, in a lot of ways, school is very safe, and it's um, I think that it's almost kind of like training to be like a firefighter, and you do all this training, and you're doing a really great job, and you're、mm -hmm. at the top of your class, but it isn't until you actually see a fire,、yeah. where you know, and you have to like save somebody's life, where you realize.、Mm -hmm. like, Who you actually are, right?、Mm -hmm. guess, maybe in a way, and、mm -hmm. I think that was for me. I know that probably is is, is like an intense <laughs> comparison, because we're obviously not fighting fires. But like for me, it was it was it was a big change. Like it was a big difference between submitting work for, to like Rick level for an assignment, <laughs> right, and versus actually getting paid to do something that was going to be published that everybody was going to see. Those、mm -hmm. are very big difference, and I think that in those moments. That's where art block is just not even a thing. It's like you just have to get to work. It's like very,、yeah. and I think that's maybe in those moments when people actually realize who they are.、Um, and and I think that you're right in that in this short period of time, you probably don't even realize how much you've improved because、yeah. just you've been doing one after another after another. You probably haven't had time to really sit back and ask yourself like or assess your situation. Mm -hmm. um, and and so I mean, so you 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 said you felt burnt out. I was going to ask you like, what your work life balance was like. Do you feel like so you said at least at one point you felt burnt out. But overall, is this it, it's been lucrative financially?、Um, but are you happy? <laughs> I guess is the question. <laughs> like, are you happy doing doing what you're doing? Because I, I think it's an important question for folks,、mm -hmm. especially folks in here who are interested in the、uh, this specific avenue of the industry, right? Like.、Mm -hmm. uh, Are you are you content? Do you feel like you have free time for mental health and to、mm -hmm. take care of yourself and so on? I think I am happy because、uh, you've got a lot of gigs and they usually come together. I don't know why, <laughs> because when you are free, you are like free. You don't have a job, and when you got one job and the second one came and the third one came, they are just like stick together.、Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's the life of a freelancer, I guess. And、uh, you、mm -hmm. got your own free time. It's different from. People taking their day jobs and、uh, yeah, I can really manage that. I I can really work like、uh, through the night and the the whole night on a very urgent thing, and、uh, I can sleep later. I can do that, and I think I'm comfortable with that kind of pace. And、uh, I have my free time. I do baking and、uh, I exercise. I go to gym. <laughs> yeah, I think that's very comfortable yeah, lifestyle for me. Good. That's great to hear. So I think that's also important too. That's something I talk about quite a bit in classes: mental health, and and、mm -hmm. uh, I think it's good to get the perspective from other people who are currently doing it.、Um, so I would love it if you could share your screen so we can see that,、um, so you can walk us through your process. Okay. So you're working primarily in Photoshop, correct? Yeah, Photoshop. Yes.、And、this is a piece I did for、uh, another local magazine in China, and this is nothing too conceptual in it. It's like they want to create this hum,、uh, harmonious、um, place for when、uh, for the high road highways, because when you drive. Uh, a long time, you need some place to rest, and these are like some stations, in the, yeah, places for drivers to rest. And the people are doing their resting, and they are taking photo photos, and they are eating things. Yeah, that's a place of、um, having a good time <laughs> during your travel. And I just add. Trees, plants, and houses, and cars, and the people doing different stuff in this. It's a very long image, vertically. And this is a、uh, coloring method I've been using recently. I think it started early this year, not from last year. Last year I painted、uh, coloring colored diff quite differently.、Uh, 
this is also something I learned from other illustrators and I saw their progress and I think this is interesting. And the, from this method, every layer of my um, file is set into multiply. So when two color layers like uh, come together and they will form this edge when they are not so uh, aligned with each other and they have this uh, overlapping area and you will have this like a uh, very dark um, line between the two color blocks kind of like screen printing and i like this effect a lot so i've been doing this a lot lately with this method so when you see the uh, layers block in this in the photoshop i i i would name these each layer with this color so it will save a lot of layers because when color is like a layer so there are like six or seven i last count in this file so i only have six or seven layers in this file but it is a labor consuming method because you have to draw like every element with their edges so you know neatly you cannot like uh, when this is uh blocked it in uh, behind another object you can you know you can you don't have to um, be so careful about the edges in this method you have to be so careful about every edge of every element it's so labor consuming but it's fun and so this is this is the this is what it looks like after you've done the color studies and you've decided on that mm -hmm. yeah I, I chose like uh six colors and yeah but uh, you will see me changing some of the colors later because it's, one color is in the layer so it's very easy to change exactly yeah i was just about to ask that if you manipulate mm -hmm. them after the fact and yeah. do you um is this the kind of line work you would send to an art director yes yes nice is this how fast you draw as well no <laughs> of course not it's accelerating i do have a question so you said you said to every layer is to a multiply right Mm -hmm, yeah. Do you do any changing of your colors at the very end to meet like a, within like a total ink density? So you make sure it doesn't print out too dark or you don't get any type of um, bleed in your colors. Is there anything that you change at the very end? Uh, I think I will check constantly. You can see I add a layer of black white on top of mm -hmm. everything. Yeah. So I will, you know, open and close that layer to check if I got the values right. Okay. But do you ever change to see which how much is in like your because you're working in RGB right now? Do yeah. you convert it to CMYK yourself, or do you just let whoever is printing it do that? What, what, what's your process for that? Uh, I don't think they ever asked uh, CMYK. Only for one client, I think they asked me to change the final piece into CMYK because they want me to do it because they want uh, the final piece to look like what I want. But right. for most editorial works, they only accept RGB. I think I don't think they will have mind the, the difference when they print in CMYK, yeah. Doug, I feel like if you did editorials, you would get so mad at the print quality and the magazine. <laughs> they, they, like, they, there was a time where the Boston Globe printed, yeah, it was the Boston Globe, they printed one of my illustrations over top of pre of a pre-existing illustration in that layout. Wow. wow. And like just forgot to remove the other one. Wow. But like I don't ever expect any of these magazines or publications to print anything well. And <laughs> there are times too, I don't know if this has happened to you, Jesse, where an art director will like up the saturation of your piece like they'll, they'll put it in photoshop or something and like change the levels or they'll use they'll use the burn tool or the dodge tool to brighten something oh. like, and then that goes to print i've i've learned to make peace with the the print so it's a i don't think there's i mean even if anybody asked me for some kind of like color profile settings like i don't think it would even matter based on the tooth of like yeah. a newspaper or a, a magazine. Yeah. It's, uh, it's in my experience, like they don't, 
I don't think they pay close attention to it. And, it, and then when they do make changes to your work, mm-hmm. it's really bad. I don't. <laughs> I have actually, I actually never came across when they changed my color. Yeah, but I, I know their quality of printing. Yeah, I don't think they, they mind that. And I think most of them also have this online version, you know, you can see digitally. So yeah, yeah. that's maybe another reason. Yeah, they don't mind. Rolling Stone changed my colors. Wow. Um, LA Times changed my colors. And I'm not wow. talking about, I'm not talking about like a little bit, like a lot. Like in a, wow, like, that's crazy. Like normally what I try to do, like as just a, a form of habit and celebration is to request a few copies in the mail. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, there are times where I just don't even bother requesting because it, <laughs> you see that, that it just came out so bad. But in the wow, end, you, know, you, get, you get paid and, and you know, yeah. They, yeah. They get what they want and you can yeah. use, you can use the good one as the as the portfolio piece, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. You can use the good one. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, when when I you know work with some clients that I don't want to share, I work with them. Yeah, I I just hide their piece and I never show their this piece in my portfolio or I have another version of my own and I will put that one in my portfolio. <laughs> yeah, I always do that. Back to back to children's book. Who? What crazy person said that your work is not? <laughs> what? Yeah, that's ridiculous. That doesn't make sense. It's like look I at that little girl with the pigtails walking the little dog. Like what? what? I don't know. They they may. Uh, that's something they want to do for. Um, I think it's like a national. Um, no, not national. Na- nature thing for like different states in the u.s like that's mm-hmm. like a series of books and they want to i forgot which state i think it's california yeah and i did i actually i put that trial piece in my in my portfolio i actually like that it's the bixby bridge that piece and i also did another thing uh, another one with the city view of I forgot it was uh, Los Angeles or or San Francisco. It's it's San Francisco, I think. And uh, there are some children involved in that picture. And I don't know why they think it's not children friendly. Friendly. I didn't put that piece in, but I put the bridge thing in that in in my portfolio. I can show you that. I think um, it's only a matter of time before you get a <laughs> children's book gig because yeah, definitely. It's very very. <laughs> much so in alignment with with that <laughs> <laughs> i hope so which is crazy because you've seen the variety of different styles of artwork for children's book and like how can you say like this is not it like if anything <laughs> it is like well it's like i maybe <laughs> put a mask on over that it's you can show <laughs> those publisher's name <laughs> <laughs> and this is the piece uh, yeah I put oh, okay, in yeah. portfolio, yeah, and this is without people in it. And uh, there's yeah. another one, this one, yeah. There are there are childrens in it, and I don't I don't know why they think this is not children friendly. I mean, I guess I don't. So that these are the pieces that they saw that made them make that. Yeah, actually, I did these pieces for a trial. They they want to see how I work with these things, and uh, yeah, they. After I did these two pieces, they said no. <laughs> yeah, it's just yeah. The, Mickey, the Mickey Mouse and the Ferris wheel too, <laughs> too inappropriate for. <laughs> for <laughs> that's that's silly. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I really, I, I think, I mean, seeing it there blown up, like the beach scene with the California, it, mm-hmm. also, it also showcases like how versatile or versatile mm-hmm. style is, you know, it could, it could very much so be advertising as well. Like advertising yeah. administration eats this stuff up. Mm-hmm. Like I had, there's somebody on our roster at my agency who mm-hmm. has a similar look to you. Like they live in a very similar style family. And mm-hmm. it, they recently did a bunch of illustrations for Royal Caribbean, and mm. I can only imagine how much that job was. It was probably like a thirty grand job.
So which, uh, so tell me about your perspective on, on um, competitions. Do you try to submit to them pretty regularly or what is, what is your perspective on that? Yeah, I, um, I think half of the result is based on luck from, mm -hmm. from my point of view. Yeah. And half is from your quality of work. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I want to keep doing that for, you know, submitting each year to those major competitions. And uh, yeah, that's like a advertising fee for a freelancer. And yeah, you just yeah. have to save for that. You, you know, it's it's the it's the cost you can never you know you know avoid. You have to spend that money. Mm -hmm. And do and do clients? Do clients? Uh, do you ask clients where they found your work typically? Not really. <laughs> I never <laughs> ask. <laughs> yeah, because I think it's interesting to hear because I I've, I've gotten mixed reviews from people where mm -hmm. they they're active in terms of submitting to competitions and yet they never when they when they uh, survey their clients to ask them where they heard about their work mm -hmm. uh, some of them are like i've never heard of a of an art director who found them in creative quarterly or an art director who found them in comarts or three by three or whatever it may be and some of them have and I've mm -hmm. just found I I, I, almost, I wish that that survey was more one sided than it actually is, just to kind of reveal whether or not competitions are really great business decisions, um, mm -hmm. once and for all. Like I wish there was a statistic on that, but anecdotally, I've only heard um, mixed reviews on that. Mm -hmm. um, like depending on who the illustrator is, it's like no, no one's ever no one's ever seen my stuff in Creative Quarterly, or oh yeah, all these art directors found my stuff in Creative Quarterly. It's yeah. um. It's really interesting because I think it's, it's it's interesting and also unfortunate that we don't I, I can't give a solid answer on that to mm -hmm. who yeah. asked me that question. You know, like I'm sure that they do, but I guess only really you can only really know if you're surveying them um, to see where they found your stuff. Mm -hmm. And when you see like people like Yuko Shimizu, they they are still like entering those competitions yeah like wow they are already like big people in this field and they are still re still entering and we have to compete with them yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're uh, entering every year like jesse jesse's talking about yuko shimizu um, <laughs> and who is the i think most recent hamilton king award winner at the society of illustrators um unless they've crowned someone with that honor recently, I don't know, but I think it was 2018, 2019, where I had the privilege of being in the show and I got to see her accept the award and it was beautiful, mm -hmm. um, which is, for those of you who don't know, the highest honor you can receive at the Society of Illustrators mm -hmm. is the Thinking Award. But Yuko yeah. is just always on fire. And yeah, she's one of those yeah. people that's like, you're competing against Yuko, you're competing against Bill Meyer. Um, <laughs> yeah. And it's just, um, I just wish it was clear on how effective these organizations are in terms of um, uh, in terms of uh, actually putting out these illustrate because they, they all make their promises. You know, it's like, yeah, we send our magazine to 4500 art directors worldwide or. Yeah. Um, and, and personally, uh, Jesse, like, I don't get a lot of clients who find my work in those those magazines me neither me neither i think i think that the um the recent thing the the communication arts best in show i think that that caused a few people to to, to notice things but just being in the magazine um mm -hmm. i haven't i haven't received because i always ask i always ask just to cultivate that survey you know <laughs> like where did you yeah. where did you find my work mm -hmm. almost always instagram Oh, yeah. um and um and it's barely any of these uh, competitions but i don't want to speak ill of these competitions because they're great you know like they're yeah. big institutions that and, and mm -hmm. many of them have been around for years and and um they're well respected and so on but it is a little unfortunate anecdotally that i haven't noticed much of a of a uh, benefit beyond just you know having the honor of sitting in the pages you know with mm -hmm. some heroes um you would think there would be more than that i guess or at least from my perspective mm -hmm. 
And I guess because maybe every year you see so many, you know, new talents emerging, and、uh, there are just so many people. And yeah. maybe, yeah, for for each and single person, you just don't get that enough attention. Yeah. Yeah. This is kind of like therapeutic. Like I'm watching, <laughs> like what the video is doing, and and every time I think you're about to go out of the lines, you don't. <laughs> it's like a it's like a visual ASMR, right? Like <laughs> like is anybody else watching this where it's like it's not going, it's not she's not messing up at all. And then she uses those really straight lines. So you're like turning the smoothing all the way up, right, to get those like super straight lines. Or what is it you're doing to get the lines, the straight lines? Yeah, you know, I guess straight line when I hit the shift, but、uh, oh, okay, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That is. But with with the circles, I because I、uh, before scared when I was you know、um, developing my interest back in the art field, I kind of had myself trained a little bit. You know, besides watercolor, I did something in the traditional Chinese painting, the ancient Chinese painting, and they use this very thin uh, br- uh, brushes and. With these very thin lines, and your your hand has to be, you know, not touching the paper. Your hand is in the middle air, and you have to draw these very straight and、uh, smooth lines. And that that will that thing that exercise actually, you know, help me a lot with my stability of my hand. Can I? I gotta ask you a question about that because、yeah. do, you know, do you know Hannah Lee? Yeah, sure. I talked But, with Hannah for a while about.、Mm-hmm. Her education in art in China.、Mm-hmm. Apparently, she said, and I, I, I'm not sure if I'm re- remembering this correctly, but she said that if you wanted to study art in China, that、mm-hmm. you had to like pass some serious tests. Yes, yes. So, did you do anything like that? No, because I went to business school. Oh, I that's right. That's right. I, <laughs>、yeah. I, I, had, I was like、uh, excused for that because I heard that is a lot of pain for that test. Yeah. So you- many people, yeah, competing with each other and drawing the same stuff, and there's so many works lying on the ground, and teacher just the 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 examiner they walk around and use a big stick to pick. Okay, this one is right. This one we can, you know, give her a mission. <laughs> And、that's、so、crazy. that is that's a test that all kids have to go through. At what age? At uh, like it's like a um, when you it's like that exam when you are attending college after you、that's、graduate、right. from high school. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, and they they have to take lessons to you know train for that that test. And that test, it's in my opinion, that test is like. Kind of old-fashioned, and they are so stubborn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they have like kind of certain style they accept, and you have to, you know, be le- that like that style, and、mm-hmm. you you don't have much freedom in that. I that's that that was part of I think what Hannah was talking about, but、mm-hmm. I'm sure that the lessons be, are like invaluable. You know,、mm-hmm. even even if you don't, you know, like stick to that specific form、mm-hmm. for the remainder of your career,、um, yeah, I, I would love to know more about what because she showed some pictures and it looked like it looked pretty devastating.、It、looked very yeah, that, that's true. That's true. I've watched that video she showed. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, it looked、uh, yeah. really intense. Yeah. And you have to be like on top of the, those. People and、uh, then you can get admitted to those top art schools in China. Yeah.、Mm-hmm. Perfect line. <laughs> Any thoughts from anybody on this? Questions at all for Jesse? Okay. A question. Sure. Oh,、um, I was just wondering when when you decided to come back to school to pursue art, like how, like how many, how long did you take to do that? Was, did you wait like a year and like start practicing or two years、uh, or preparing to attend、uh, art school? Yes. Yeah, it took like、uh, about two years. Yeah, because I, yeah, two years. I because I was I was.、Uh, 
you know, attracted to watercolor, and then I found the illustration. And uh, when I found the illustration, I decided I have to study it because um, I don't see any good opportunities within China mainland, and uh, I seek opportunities outside China. And uh, that's when I decided to pursue a um, degree outside China, and uh, I started to prepare, and that took like two years because I have to build the entire portfolio. I didn't have any piece to show by then. So I have like uh, two years to because I have to work in the same time at the same time. So yeah, I, that take a little longer. When you were doing that, did you did you have like any art mentors or is that just kind of something you did solo by yourself? Yeah, I have kind of, you can call that a mentor. Um, we have this, it's like a business. Um, when you have this agent, they can prepare you from uh, for applying art school um, from abroad. And uh, yeah, you have actually you have to pay money to them. And uh, they have this teacher, one, one to one. And uh, I have this teacher, they, they, uh, she is like in charge of my case and she will give advice on my projects in my portfolio and she will like uh, lead me through the whole process yeah awesome thank you you're welcome Sorry, my mic was off. Do you normally keep the line art in at the end or do you take it out? Sorry? Oh, is my mic still off? No, no, it's... Do you, do you normally keep the line art in at the end or do you take it out at the end? No, I take it out. It's, okay, it's and just, you're adding, yeah. And you're adding other, okay, yeah. Yeah. In terms of, in terms of, uh, in terms of stylization of your figures and your characters, Mm -hmm. Have you always just kind of been doing it like this or do, did you like, I don't know, dedicate some practice to your characters? Yeah, that's something have been bothering me because you, as you see through my work, I have different kind of characters in those because uh, for this kind of flat, you know, um, scene thing, I usually draw like characters like this. But when there is a piece, you have to focus on one person uh, it's it's it will tend to more um, realistic style because you have I will have more shades on the people's face and uh, you know with uh, specific on the eyes its nose and the mouth but with these people I never draw their eyes <laughs> eyes or mouth or things like that yeah I just keep them simple so I think I have different styles on people and that's been worrying me for a uh, for a period of time but i think i get over it with it now you know there, <laughs> I, I, I can't have a different style yet i was actually just coincidentally talking for about an hour and a half today with an illustrator named louisa jung um she's an argentinian illustrator but she lives in germany now mm -hmm. and um she is she has a, she lives in a similar style family to you and she, she had contacted me. She wanted to have a Zoom session to talk about how to, because she has a lot of these scenes like that you have where the characters are small and they exist in a, in a big environment or mm -hmm. the characters are small and they exist in an environment where the concept kind of reigns supreme. Um, and it's more about the concept and less about the people, but the people are there as like a s sort of afterthought kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and she was wanting to, um, figure out a way to create compositions that focused more on people and faces and less mm -hmm. about the environment. And she was having issues like taking these smaller characters that you have here, just like this, and then enlarging them and then putting the same love that she puts into an entire piece into just the character so that it's mm -hmm. just about a portrait and not about everything else. And mm -hmm. it was honestly, it was kind of hard for me to respond to it. Like I wasn't really sure because she showed me like they like commissioned her uh, Rolling Stone Germany commissioned her to do a portrait of Elvis Costello. Mm -hmm. She showed me that portrait and you can tell she's trying really hard on it. It looks great. 
but it doesn't look like her other characters in her pieces like the the, the pieces that are busier pieces that have a bunch of little characters with less mm -hmm. detail, like you said the characters that you don't draw the face or the eyes right yeah. um and i think one of my one of my pieces of feedback to her was to um blow up one of her characters like this guy right here reading this paper like blow mm -hmm. up that shape and then work into that shape and add more detail um mm -hmm. focus on specific areas like bone structure and hair lines and expression mm -hmm. and so on but um beyond that i wasn't i felt like i wasn't really able to help her as much because it's a really interesting query you know like how can i take my small characters that have less detail you know how do you yeah. even respond to that to that question um but i think that's a it seems like what you're saying and correct me if i'm wrong that's something that you're struggling with too yeah i think that that's almost impossible to you know put, uh, when you are drawing big characters and small characters and they look like exactly the same style i think it's very hard to achieve that i can show you some pieces i did it's actually from last year uh i actually worked for a magazine uh, cover it's on um, here uh, let me see there's a part of me like especially if it's like the end of the day and i'm really tired my, <laughs> response, my response to that question is draw your characters bigger and put more detail in them I'm like i don't know I don't, I don't know do you get what i'm talking about doug yeah that's that's stuff I thought about a lot before too. Is because I think what you're doing such a good job at. I think you're almost doing like the b backwards way. Like people try to simplify the work so much and come up with a very good shorthand and like how can their stuff read small and still be iconic. And like now you want to make it bigger and like add the stuff on there that we've already think about default. Like we see these details in people's features all the time. Yeah. And so like maybe it's I don't. I mean I'm not trying to tell you how to do your art, of course, but like. It's like maybe it just doesn't need those details like maybe for that approach like that's what it is because I, I think it's so successful the way it is right now um it's kind of like i don't know what's a good example like if you see a drawing of rick and morty or like any other type of card like and you see like a close-up of it like you don't want to see like extreme details but when they do or if they do in like an exaggerated style of it who used to do that a lot like ren and stimpy like do you, i don't know if you've ever seen that before when they had like these really close-up versions of one of the characters it would be like this illustrated style, but it'd still be to the same quality or same yeah. house style of the character. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's so funny because I was looking at your work and it makes sense. Like why I don't need a lot of details or faces because there's a lot of, the detail is the things that populate your composition. It's like the amount of like cars, the amount of buildings, the amount of figures, like that is the detail in the composition. Is it the detail individual item? So it's like, yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting that you bring that up because it's like, in many instances, the golden egg is how can I simplify? Right. <laughs> like yeah. you said, it's going, it's going the other way. I'm going to share my screen real quick. Just to, uh, just to do the, uh, the Ren and Stimpy thing. I don't know if you remember Bob Rosetto, Doug, but I uh, interviewed him. He's a huge Ren and Stimpy fan. Look at this. I can see that. But yeah. Right? Like it's just very, it brings that like classic Ren and Stimpy shape language. Yes. Um, I just did that is, to you today. Yeah. This is Luisa's work. Um, we were talking, and this was her Elvis Costello piece, right? So beautiful piece. But yeah. it, what I was saying is, why not this, right? <laughs> like these are her tiny little characters that you see in her in her pieces they're very they kind of take the back seat they're more just kind of like doing things to mm -hmm. enhance the concept which is what i think most of your stuff does like it's that the the character is not like this you don't need to see the wrinkles in their face right they're there to do something and to move something and to manipulate right. it. but it's like i think her question was like how do i make this get this shape language to feel like that elvis costume and that's where I got lost. I was like, I just don't know. Like, I, I guess draw draw bigger, like practice using traditional media that like, that uh, in larger formats. I think that's an important thing for anybody to do is to try, try long form um, art, like that takes like a year to finish. I know that's like a nightmare for a lot of people, but like one piece that you work on like every day for a year. Yeah. Um, 
could be a really, you know, it probably the worst thing in the world, but you like will learn things from it, you know? But anyway, mm-hmm. that's not your problem. That's Luisa's problem. I was talking <laughs> I was talking to Luisa about this today, but it did seem like you expressed a little bit of the same sentiment where you were like how to translate the smaller people to like focus more on the bigger people. Let's see that uh that John Lennon again and the others too. Yeah. Yeah, because when you're asked to draw a people specifically with their, you know, facial, you know, uh, you know, eyes and noses, it's often that this this is a famous people, and you have to draw like that people. So you don't you don't have a choice actually. You just have to draw like that people. And when you are doing these little people, they don't have to look like anyone. They just you know, yeah, random people. So I I think that's two different story. If I was still your teacher, I would give you a project <laughs> to to do to make John Lennon look like one of your smaller people. Wow! Like to like take like like you can only make John Lennon using the same amount of marks. Wow! Did with this character here with the green shirt on. <laughs> like, I feel like you could do it. I feel like that would be so rad. Not to say that this John Lennon is doesn't work. It works. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. It just it, there, there's that. I think that was part of Luis's concern was the mm-hmm. you know, maybe getting, with his, her, his gestures or hairstyle, and you can recognize that's him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like you do. You ever see um uh, Al Hirschfeld stuff? Yes, it's exactly what I was gonna mention. Yes. Right. Like just yes. two lines. <laughs> <laughs> just uh I, I i've shown al hirschfeld stuff in the past but um if whenever i think of like the simplest thing <laughs> um i think of al hirschfeld stuff. I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna hijack your screen again to show al hirschfeld okay but this is al hirsch have you seen this stuff uh jesse yeah yeah i think so just look at this <laughs> frank sinatra yeah. I would have never been able to do that ever. Um, and I love the Al Hirschfeld story. How he wanted something different, went to a movie theater to sketch what was on the screen, mm-hmm. and realized he could not see a sketchbook in the darkness of the theater, and did all of these sort of like partial blind contours. And that mm-hmm. was what kickstarted this, this look. Mm-hmm. Like, that is. Yeah. So jealous. <laughs> yes. But anyway, we're coming up on time. Does anybody have any last minute questions for Jesse? I know we've been talking about a lot of stuff. Well, any last minute advice you have for young aspiring illustrators, Jesse? <laughs> well, uh, I guess just keep drawing, keep working. If you don't get gigs for a period of time you have to give yourself a personal project just keep the flow going and uh, you can rest for a while but don't rest too long because that <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, that because when you when you just take too long a break i think that that feel will go away and yeah it just it's hard to pick up it again you sound like my physical therapy coach <laughs> we're only, we're only gonna re- rest for 10 seconds, run for one minute. I, I 100% agree. You need to feel pain, everyone. Everyone needs to feel some pain. Yeah. yeah. And mm-hmm. yeah, so I think that that's, a, that's great. And, um, and you're fantastic. I'm so proud of you. And, Thank you. Um, and so thankful that you did this uh, with us. And it was really great to catch up with you. Thank you for showcasing your gorgeous skill. Um, when it comes to the character building, the, the conceptual illustration stuff, um, you know, let me know if there's anything you need from me. I'll do my best to reciprocate. Um, and, um, you know, I hope you enjoyed this, everybody. And as yeah. always, I hope you learned something new. Um, happy September 14th. Not a special day, except Jesse's here. So it's very special. Um, and um, enjoy your weekend, everybody, if we don't see you. And this is officially the fourth common ground artist lecture series thank you jesse thank you thank jesse you for me. thank you for having me i had a great time if you have any questions jesse just shoot me an email and okay. have a great evening everybody i'll see you all tomorrow <laughs>